This is a film about the positives and the difficulties of personal growth and transformation. It's with Raffia Morgan, who's a good friend and mentor, and also one of the best facilitators and counsellors I've worked with, with 40 years of experience on how we become more authentic. The word persona means mask, and so it's been recognised that the personality, that somebody recognised it a long time ago in formation of language. This is not representing your essence, this is representing you know, the identity, the mask that you put on that was that strategy to survive, to get approval, to get love, to avoid punishment, whatever, in a certain environment. But it's not who we are. And that is a burning process to go through that, but it has to happen with great compassion and great empathy. We also talked about the history of different transformational processes, how they work and why some don't work. A really important point to get that a lot of people don't get is that you're not wrong for being the way that you are. And the personality structure that working out of basically works, and it was an intelligent strategy given the holding environment that you grew up in. And so it's not about changing that person, but it's about optimizing the possibilities for them to have self-discovery rather than doing what some of the older and less sophisticated styles of therapy do, which, and what our minds do, and what even our personalities do, is try to get rid of things. And it actually makes the thing, most of the time, stronger. We're releasing this now because Raffia is launching a new online course in October. Check out the details in the show notes below, and hope you enjoy the film. So Raffia, welcome. Thank you, David. So this is going to be a slightly different film to the films we normally put out on the channel. It'll be a lot more personal because of our relationship. You're a very close friend. You deliberately stepped into something of a kind of mentor role when my father died about 10 years ago now, um, which is another film that has gone up on the channel. I put a film out about the talk that I gave about the death of my father and how that was a really... Um, yeah, really deep experience going through that and what happened afterwards and you also helped us with the men's work. We have done men's retreats at the same time and we also do other kinds of um, workshops. I've trained with you at your training called Working With People, which is what we're gonna get into in a minute, talking about some of the frameworks, talking about some of your background. And I know you as someone who's an incredibly talented facilitator, probably the best facilitator I've worked with and I've been sort of like a, workshop junkie for a good kind of 15 years doing all sorts of different kind of transformational processes and meditations and all sorts of different kind of things. Um, I'm going to play a quick clip from you that we filmed a few years ago that I think kind of encapsulate a lot of people really like and I think it really encapsulates a lot of your kind of philosophy on life. If I use myself as an example, I feel like when I am locked into my personality, which is a result of my conditioning, I am, it's like I'm looking at the world through a lot of filters and sets of beliefs and through an identity of who I take myself to be. And intrinsic in that is a certain sense of being separate, a certain feeling of it's not quite it, or I'm missing the, the depth of contact that I felt in other moments when I felt wide open, where I felt in connection with nature or with another person, or in a moment of awe and wonder by some natural beauty or touched by art or love. You know, many, there's many doorways, what I call into being, where I experience that sense of oneness. And in my normal day-to-day -day personality, which it's fine, you know, it is basically an intelligent strategy to survive in the environment I grew up in, and it works. But in it, I often experience a certain sense of separation and isolation. And in me, because of these moments that I've been blessed to have in my life, where I felt deeply connected, there's, there's a longing and a yearning to live in that space. And for me, I feel like I've had the good fortune and the intelligence to follow that longing 
and to see where it, and to make it a high priority in my life. And it's led me to into contact with beautiful people and into with communities of people with certain shared ideals of wanting to realize their deepest potential. And it has become kind of central to the work that I do, where I try and inspire people to get in touch with that inner longing or urge and let it guide them. And I really trust this is like one of the most precious things we have inside. That longing will take you where you need to go. So if I'm longing for freedom, which I am, it doesn't take me necessarily to freedom. It takes me in the direction of freedom, but it takes me to those places inside of myself where I've cut myself off from freedom, where I've put up a barrier. So the longing is very, um, is very precise. If you really feel it, it takes you where you need to go, and where you need to go is where you shut down. And the good news about that is it's very possible to work through those places, to feel through those places, to bring understanding, to bring compassion, to bring awareness to those places and become free of them, you know, and, and move on. Otherwise, you know, we just stay stuck in our personalities. We're just basically going round and round and round and round. And for a lot of people, I guess that's good enough. For me, it never really was. I always had this, mm, this feeling there's something more. What is it? You know, this, we're here for such a short amount of time. I, I, you know, I guess one way to say it is I want it all. So maybe let's start with, you've kind of made transformational work your life now for 40 odd years. Could you tell a little bit of that story and what is it that you, what, what is it that you do? What is your passion? Gladly try and tell you that story in a short amount of time. 40 years sounds like a long time to have been at it, but it's true. Um, basically, I started off in political activism and came to realize that I was an angry guy who was pointing his finger everywhere, but I wasn't anywhere inside myself. And that started me to question myself. And that questioning led me to doing inner work meditation, things like that, and became the beginning of what's become a, an occupation, an identity, and the birth of whoever it is that I am right now. So it, and that's led me on a long course, and it still does, um, to many trainings, to many groups which I've led, to etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's just leave it at that. How do you see your work relating to the world out there? Because we're bringing sort of current affairs and um, news and cultural topics, but bringing them into a sort of more philosophical, more psychological, more transformational, more spiritual, because we don't have a better word than that, frame. So how do you see those things linking together for you? Well, first I want to say that's one of the things I really respect about Rebel Wisdom is that you take on some of the really tough issues where people are really charged and there is a lot of polarity and as best as is possible, try to be objective, which as we know is a really, really difficult, maybe it's almost impossible, impossible thing to do. Yeah, let's say it like it is. And so what I'm really curious about then is in myself, when I find I have a really strong reaction to something, and I do have strong reactions and opinions and biases and righteousness and can point my finger and stamp my feet and get all huffed up about something, is to be really curious about myself. Like, why do I have such a strong reaction? What is that saying about me? What is it that's inside me that maybe hasn't been digested that keeps me part of the problem rather than achieving some kind of potential inside of myself where I might become part of a solution, where I might actually be willing to go to a synthesis and learn something. And that requires exercising some very different muscles than we're usually conditioned in. You know, it's like we're outward oriented through our conditioning. We look for the problems outside and we look for the solutions outside. And we maybe even can talk the good talk about, yeah, yeah, I know I have to look at myself and everything. But to actually do it and to actually track 
those strong reactions and those strong impulses and question your own beliefs and see, well, who am I? Who is this person inside? And then stay with the experience of the, the force of that as it comes up. And in a way, by being curious about it, which is part of the process, one of the processes I teach is about inquiry, it shifts it back in and something about that charge gets, starts to get metabolized. You know, it goes down a little bit and it comes back a little bit more here and more openness come. I may still have my opinions, but I'm more open to be able to meet and look at the world a bit more objectively. And I'm more connected to myself because I took that decision not to just point my finger and shout and be righteous and everything and be really curious and to the best of my ability, love the truth and be honest about myself, you know? And sometimes what that uncovers is an old wound inside that is just activated and would cause me to take a position or be against something. And when I go a little bit deeper, it's like, oh God, old memories might come up, feelings, emotions might come up, and then I have something to digest inside of me that's personal to me that's actually part of forming my opinion or judgment about something. Yeah, and you've touched on it already, like the, the, the transformative power of truth is something quite extraordinary that I think, I hope a lot of people can, can resonate with. We, you talked about inquiry, which is the model that we've worked with in some of our courses, and also John Viveki at the moment is, is kind of really bringing back an interest in forms of inquiry, forms of like live dialogue between people, like what happens when we go into this kind of space together of exploration, and he calls it dialogos. And his main theory is that this is where, this is where Greek philosophy came from, this is where novelty comes from, this is where everything that then gets codified as a system comes initially from this kind of live exploration into the truth that we do together. Um, and that, I find that really interesting, that that's sort of at the core of, um, yeah, I'd say it's at the core of what we're trying to do to the best of our abilities to kind of find the truth. Like it's the unifying factor, I think, in, in, and it's, it's internal truth as well as external truth. It's like, what does that feel like as a embodied experience? Yeah, and I think that love of the truth is actually a state inside that we generally don't operate from. So it requires some experience of going in and seeing that process that you're describing right now where you start digging in there and you find like, okay, this time I'm going to tell the truth. What is it? You know, and you go a little bit deeper than the personality's defensive nature and start inquiring into yourself. And that's going to bring you to a different place. So it can be a, a remembrance. Oh, love of the truth. What's my truth right now? It's not absolute truth. It's the truth as I'm experiencing it right now. And be present with that and allow something to emerge out of that, which may then go into the conversation with you and then you respond and then we're hunting and chasing it down together. And that's a thrilling prospect rather than the usual personality banter and positioning and defense and so on. So it's a, it's a big one. Um, it can be developed so that it's remembered and applied. And then sort of like, oh yeah, what is that thing about truth? Yeah, I love the truth, do I? Yes. <laughs> Let me find the feeling sense of loving the truth. And there's a certain somatic experience that's happening when you're loving the truth. It's almost like there's a certain warrior quality that comes in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go for it. I'm not going to just go the easy way. Yeah. And I find that that's empowering. It also is inviting something new to come in mm -hmm. because it's so easy to just stay with our set beliefs and conditionings and then just stay in that. And then we don't make any real contact with anything new or with anybody. Mm -hmm. So loving the truth, it's scary for the personality. Personality hates it. Yeah, and that's why I like, I like this kind of reframing around bravery as well. Like we talk about this as one of the core qualities and we do this very much in our men's work. The, the, the men's work that you helped us kind of put together. It's like 
do you have the courage to really look at that? Do you have the re really have the courage to look at where you're fixated, to look at where your belief structures? Because like, it's scary. It's scary to question those, and it's it's a brave thing to do, and it's it's why it's often better to do it in a group of of people that maybe you you don't know. That's why a workshop works, is you don't have these kind of existing um, unconscious kind of deals with the people out there of, of, that you might have with your family or with your friends of this is the person that I'm going to be. It get, you're allowed to experiment more. And you also talked about this sense that, that this, this is a, a practice that we also developed is like that sense of frustration when we don't speak the truth. Like really tapping into that sense of frustration when we don't speak the truth or we hold back or we don't say something that we need to or like recognizing that as well as a part of our experience and then using that as fuel to be to kind of really use that to say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do that again. That is something that, and, and there's a really, like a lot of this personal growth work exists in a very kind of, I'd say sort of feminine space or a very kind of, uh, it's a very accepting, non-judgmental space, which is very, which is essential for it to work. But also sometimes I feel like it loses that sense of, no, you need the bravery, you need the you need the, the ability to cut through. You need to say what's really true. You need to potentially kind of give people reflections or to accept reflections and to be really brutally honest about what we're doing and what we're bringing to things. And, and that's what happens in groups, as you mentioned, that group environment. And with good facilitation, you're offering support for a person, which is, a person can feel as support. You're not judging their personality because it's just an intelligent strategy to survive in the environment they grew up in. But you're supporting them to go a little bit deeper and to access that courage and to take a risk and to come out. And, and what is that feeling inside that you have that you never let anybody see? You know? And what would happen if you let that come out right now? And then a lot of times, that just that little nudge and it's, an, and it's a nudge of support. It's, it can happen in confrontation. Sometimes that's the necessary way. But and it can be compassionate. But also, let's, let's be careful because sometimes the confrontation, especially in the 70s, became like very toxic, like the whole kind of encounter group process and all of that, that I think it is, like a lot of that damaged people, like it went too far. And I agree. Like, I mean, we can get onto it in a second. I think there's a really interesting story about what happened when somatic experiencing came in, when the trauma work came in in the 90s. And was able to explain what happened when people were pushed beyond their boundaries. But maybe that just, just before we kind of, um, I think putting a little bit of that kind of framework around it might be needed. I think I would use the word, um, rather than confronting, it's um, challenging. Mm. You know, because confronting sometimes has and a very And it's better invasive. if we're challenging ourselves rather than being challenged from the outside. Right, so it's a support to challenge yourself. And sometimes it, sometimes it has a little bit of urging on because you can feel it in somebody and they want to take that step and it's like come on just say what it is you're really feeling right now that's challenging but it's supportive at the same time and i'm right here i got your back you can't do it wrong you know just take that risk what is it you always wanted to say you and know so, and that's and some, a wonderful yeah. moment and sometimes the thing that someone wants to say is i fucking hate it here this is shit yes. i hate you i hate everyone it's like Great. As long as you say that, that allows it to shift. That allows you to kind of, because otherwise, if you're just thinking it and not saying it, you're out of alignment. So that's, I mean, we've all had that experience in, in groups where the thing that someone doesn't want to say is like, I hate you and I hate you and I hate you. And it's like, well, great. Now we can work with that. It's kind of. Exactly. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy if the person says that because I'm feeling it anyway you know, in their withheld. And if they just come out with it, it frees something up. And then to the person's surprise, a lot of time, I stay present and I meet them in that, yeah, okay, you hate me, what do you hate about me? You know, and get them to come out with a bit more. And then the story unfolds, you know, and then the connection and contact happens between us. So, yeah. and the somatic experiencing you mentioned a moment ago, it brought in a big insight into the therapy world that I was working in because it emphasized the necessity of creating a safe space for people. And, some, and that's a process. In some of the groups, I'm aware that the first couple of days I'm creating a safe place. It's still challenging for people, but we're making it safe for them. They start to realize, oh, I'm actually in a place where I can say what I want, what I need, what I feel, you know, and what my vision is. Yeah. Instead of, um, 
immediately I'm editing it to the audience that I think I'm in front of. I'd love to, to maybe talk about some of the, the core concepts that I know you work with and you've developed in those processes. Um, for example, um, all the barriers are on my side is something that I remember that is something you've talked about quite a lot. Well, it's a really interesting concept, you know, because we want things, and if we go deeper, that wanting can turn into our heart's longing, and we try to get to that place where what is it that you really long for or want or aspire to, and get person oriented to that. And the, the understanding that we have is that when you get really give that longing the space that it needs to be expressed, there's something inside of us that starts to orient us towards the object of our longing, towards what we want. But where does it take us? It doesn't take us right to the end. It takes us to the barriers. So that for are preventing example, that. when you long, you long for freedom or you long for truth or whatever. Right, and then some experience will come up, say, from your childhood where you felt really restrained and you collapsed, let's say, and you now are afraid of freedom because you were punished for it, and so you don't actually take the step and come all the way through and show, and show up and show yourself because you're afraid you're going to get beaten again or hold back. So that becomes a barrier to the freedom because it's that state of always holding back. And so all the barriers on my side is a very potent statement because it puts the responsibility back here. And again, it's, it's that movement and that shift from the outer, which maybe the longing ostensibly is oriented to. It's actually an inner state that's wanted to be achieved, but that helps to bring it back. Well, then why are you not free? Or why are you not you know, living your relationships the way you want to? What is it in you that's preventing that? And would, are you interested to look at that and what comes up right now and what do you notice in your body as, we, as I'm talking to you so that we're finding little doorways and ways to go in. But it's very, has a certain softness to it also. It's like I'm not telling you, you know, and some of the old style therapists, and I can say I was guilty of it years ago, that was kind of what we did. You know, and we had our kind of formulaic things that we would push down people's throats and guaranteed to get a big emotional response and you felt like, oh, I've done a good piece of work, but it started to come up that maybe you just re-traumatized that person. So it has to be on that person's terms and then everybody is individual and so it requires a great sensitivity to work with people and to feel people and to, and to really to love them, you know, and to be present. Maybe that's a better word to use because part of presence is love. To just be present with that person without being judgmental, without feeling like you know and optimizing the field of interaction between you so that that person can discover for themselves. And there's something in people that recognizes that when that happens. They relax. Yeah, because you're not trying to force them in any direction, you're not trying to expect. I mean, I think that's one of the hardest things for therapists, even relatively experienced therapists to do is to just to wait because the temptation is, especially if you've done, if you fancy yourself as someone who's done quite a lot of inner, inner growth work and you know kind of where someone's coming from and you can kind of see part of their personality structure and the temptation is to kind of go in there. And I think that a lot of therapists probably overstep the mark and start trying to kind of like push people faster than they're willing to go and like that's, that's a really dangerous thing to do. Yeah, why do things go wrong so often and how do you try and make sure that they don't? Well, the thing primarily I think that's really important, a really important point to get that a lot of people don't get is that you're not wrong for being the way that you are. And the personality structure that working out of basically works and it was an intelligent strategy given the holding environment that you grew up in. And so it's not about changing that person, but it's about um, optimizing the possibilities for them to have self-discovery rather than doing what some of the older and less sophisticated styles of therapy do, which and what our minds do and what even our personalities do is try to get rid of things. And, and that's part of like, to 
kill the ego or to get rid of this habit or to get rid of that and to change that around in that you include everything and you have the possibility to stay with it and that actually trying to get rid of things is a subtle to not so subtle form of hate you know and it actually makes the thing most of the time stronger so if you engage in people in that kind of a dy dynamic where you're already participating with a place where they maybe hate themselves and you're helping them hate themselves a little bit by trying to get rid of things somewhere deep down inside i feel like the the bolts are getting a little bit tighter on that structure mm -hmm. rather than being there in a in an open and and even slightly humorous ways sometimes, you know, where, you, where you're engaging the people about, yeah, that's your personality and that's how, you, that's how you function. And loosening the structure up, loosening the bolts up a little bit. Yeah, I guess it's also that a lot of, the, a lot of work or a lot of kind of um, previous thinking, especially from sort of the 70s, 80s, was based on an idea that the ego is wrong or the ego has to be transcended or the ego has to be destroyed. Like that that model, I think, is part of what creates that kind of that damage as well, because that's it's, it's a really, um, yeah, my, my sense is it's a really naive and really dangerous misunderstanding about what our personalities are, what they're for and how how we're how we're, we're structured and actually trying to do that, trying to kind of overcome it or um, in some way kind of destroy it is is incredibly toxic. Like that, that's something that seems to show up in a lot of these. Right. And, and not only that, but then if you're more spiritually oriented, then you have spiritual bypass strategies where you create an identity with a higher state so the person can avoid that part and then try and keep their identity up here. And my experience with that is it absolutely doesn't work because the whole thing down here is just kind of seething with even more energy by it, the denial of it. So, in, and it really comes into basically part of the work that I do, I call essence work. And it's, it has the understanding that every aspect of our personality, however deplorable it might be in the actions that it takes, however divisive it might be, however much it's sabotaging your life in some way, is a doorway into your being if you really own it and you stay with it and then you historically track it a little bit to like where did this come from how did i become this way and be curious about it and then with skillful skillful interventions you're you're just like helping the person to stay present with that and then they're noticing a lot of times that oh i'm feeling really something different right now you know and that might take a few sessions or a while i'm you know fast forwarding but by moving around that, they find that that very thing that they wanted to get rid of is calling their attention so strongly in therapy because it's actually a doorway into beingness or into essence or into, you could call it true nature or a groundedness or a lack of separation with the environment and with other people. And I've just seen it so many times, whereas the other one doesn't. It actually strengthens the separation. And you mentioned spiritual bypassing, and I think that's a really important concept because that's why I don't like the word spirituality is because almost every time someone uses it now, I hear spiritual bypassing. Like when people talk about spirituality, it's usually like just up and out and oh, angels and kind of like it's a, it's a way of avoiding reality. Whereas my definition of like real spirituality, and this is something that Aisha can be said recently uh, in, our, in our talk at Wilderness is, to her, spirituality is the burning off of all that is false. Exactly. Which is, which is, which is a per like that, that for me is, is true, and that's what I love about the work that, that, that we've done and my understanding of that kind of process is, it's about becoming, accepting our full humanness, rather than trying to kind of pretend we're something we're not or try and get somewhere else. I love that quote, burning off what's false, you know, because, and, and what is false, and this is where it's tricky to hold the understanding because the word persona means mask. And so it's been recognized that the personality, 
that somebody recognized it a long time ago in formation of language. This is not representing your essence. This is representing, you know, the identity, the mask that you put on that was that strategy to survive, to get approval, to get love, to avoid punishment, whatever, in a certain environment. But it's not who we are. And that is a burning process to go through that, but it has to happen with great compassion and great empathy from the person who's working with them. And then it can happen, and once you kind of get the knack of it, and you stay with that curiosity, and you recognize what it's like when you're in the false, because there'll be a defensiveness and a hardness and a righteousness a lot of times, and the, you know, the finger pointing out sort of thing. So spiritual bypassing happens sometimes where we do have spiritual experiences, whether we're making love or walking someplace in nature or taking a psychedelic or something where we, we see a bigger reality or we have an experience of no separation and oneness, something like this. And then we, our mind, as the mind and personality comes back into it, creates a concept around it and a picture of it, and this is who I really am. And then tries to create these shortcuts to be that all the time, rather than to appreciate that that was a momentary outcome and glimpse of grace, basically, that came through some courageous act or hard work that you were doing, something like this. And so, and that's, and then people have created therapies and models and stuff which are enhancing that spiritually bypassed place. And even, even transcending has, we, we transcend, it is possible to transcend, but it's not the process of going beyond in that way that it rejects anything. For me, it's a process of burning off what's false, and we find ourselves in what could be called a spiritual space where we're not um, armored and held down and back by the weight of that old structure we've been in. And that's, that's just noble right action. <laughs> and we'll talk in a minute about the essence work that you brought up before, but um, before that, like how many different kind of models are you familiar with, have you used over the years? Like what, are, what kind of different, different models do you find useful and do you work with? God, it's all so blended in together right now as the work that I do. I have to think for a little bit, but you know, I mean, I started off doing bioenergetics, still great stuff, you know, Reichian work and uh, personality types and starting to understand in that, starting to get an understanding of developmental trauma, but not as strongly as I do now, you know, but using that also for a way of opening the body and catharting, and it was still part of a little bit of the old mindset and doing prime, I was trained in primal groups, so taking people back into their childhoods. But again, it was rough compared to the work that I do now, let's say. And I think the general feeling is that primal as a model was discredited. Um, and I wonder whether that's because, I mean, I've done, I've done a primal process that I thought was really powerful. Like it did mm -hmm. a lot of processing of um, stuff to do with, especially my relationship with my mother. Um, but I, I feel like the reason that it is discredited or seen as discredited was because it didn't in integrate the trauma work. It was literally trying to kind of scream your way out of, Primal out screen. of stuff. Yeah, it was, it was and, and it didn't understand like the integration. It was still sort of about, um, the, like we talked about, there was a sort of subtle hatred of the personality, there was a subtle hatred of conditioning, there was an attempt to kind of break free that didn't understand the, the wider integration which came in with the somatic experiencing work with, Peter Levine and Stephen Porges and all of those kind of great therapists, the trauma work um, that, that came in pretty much in the 90s. And I remember talking to, to you and to your co-facilitator, Taria, and she said she did somatic experiencing work and then came back and said, everybody stop. We're, you don't realize it, but, but all of us are, are potentially damaging people unless we unless we do this work which I have a lot of respect for because I think a lot of people didn't do that a lot of people are still doing the stuff that they were doing back in the 70s and 80s and um, are, are unsafe therapists and unsafe facilitators um, but I also know that you 
you've got a background in Jungian work, you use the Enneagram, the Essence work, and all of these different kind of modalities as well. Yeah, I, I worked really a lot with male, female, masculine, feminine, went into the Jungian work, into Tantric work, into Taoist work, where they're working with the polarities from the yin-yang to the masculine, feminine. Um, many, many, it just kind of overwhelms me when I think of my history of how many things I've gone into. But what I want to come back to is what you mentioned a moment ago was that when I did the, the SE trauma work and, and really came to understand that even though I personally am grateful for the cathartic work that I did and for the opening my body and opening up energy pathways inside of myself and coming out of some things, I was stuck. It couldn't go any further. It was like, a, it was like step one kept repeating itself, something like that. And then to, to embrace and understand this, that there's so much that has to do with the nervous system that's part of a person's digesting of the trauma and the defenses in the body and the behavior in the body, and which requires a, a safety and a certain way of languaging that they also teach in SE, which I took on very wholeheartedly. And it just turned, even Path of Love, which I think was always a great group, but after we had done somatic experiencing, it changed. And, and, it, and there was a lot more, it was just softer and it was more spacious and we were more present because of that, you know? And so that work worked on us. We also digested a lot of our traumas and stuff by doing that work and by taking sessions and coming to understand that. And then the next thing that came along that was so important was the essence work. I can't even remember which one came first. I think the introduction to the essence work came first. And this was some work that was put together by two Kuwaiti men, Hamid Almas and Faisal Mukadam. And I first read a book of Hamid Almas in, in India and I was like, just amazed that he was describing a kind of map of behaviors in the personality and correlations and connections to states of being. And I felt like it just was like answering questions that I didn't even know I had. I was like so enthused. I was running around showing this book to everybody, like get this and that. I even wrote to Almas and asked him if we, he would, I would get a group of 30, you know, kind of very experienced therapists together and would he train us? And he wrote a lovely letter back and said um, that his work lended itself to the long term. And so we were like, okay, well, I guess we'll read the books. And then that summer I met Faisal and he, we got him to come over to Europe and he was one of the discoverers of this. They were both graduate students at Berkeley and they started using scientific methodology, inquiry, on themselves. And all of a sudden all these things started opening up inside and they'd, they'd dropped their pursuit of a PhD and became PhDs of the inner. And created this amazing system and that has just been such a, a room of riches for me that I'm still very involved with and it has this methodology called inquiry which we've touched on earlier in this talk about being really curious, courageous, loving the truth, compassionate, and joyful are the five basic components of inquiry. And it's an art to learn how to navigate with this, but it's one that anybody can learn. And it's that turning, what we t started this talk with, turning the external reactions and stuff inwardly and being curious about yourself and then going on this unfolding process inside till you arrive at some new understanding or some new embodiment of some part of yourself which was closed off because you were so identified with the, let's call it shell. There's another word for personality. Yeah, and 
the essence work, work was also really at the core of the the, the training that that Ali and I have done with you, the, the working with people training. So inquiry was at the basis of it, like the form of inquiry, that was a sort of therapy, a therapist training, learning to be a, a counsellor. So using inquiry, so you're exploring the truth together with the person that you're, you're in the session with. And what I found fascinating about that is that as I developed that skill interpersonally, I felt like it also helped develop it in the outside world. Like you start becoming more attuned to what is wanting to be expressed in yourself, what is kind of, uh, or wanting to emerge in the space between you and other people. And then you also start to then, that becomes a skill you can then use to kind of tune into like, okay, what's what's emergent in the culture? What's kind of feeling like it's coming through or where, or where becoming more attuned to novelty, kind of a seeker of novelty and a seeker of truth, I guess, in the outside world. Um, but what I found fascinating about the essence work when we, we learnt it on working with people is your explanation of it as, as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the model is that there are essential qualities, qualities of, of being that we have arising naturally, spontaneously, that the ego tries to impersonate because it can't really, it, 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 the, the ego or the personality is basically a, a structure that tries to mimic essential qualities but can't do it. So does it in a kind of um, warped way that then creates a lot of um, problems for us out in the world. Is that a good summary or how, how would you describe the system? <laughs> it's pretty good. And the one part I would add to that is that the law, it's like if you think of us born as pure potential with our essence intact, let's just say. And then through the way that we are conditioned and through that holding environment and through what's reflected and rewarded and loved and what's denied and pushed away, etc., controlled, we lose contact with certain aspects of our essential nature. You could use the example um, perhaps somebody was not really supported to really individuate and go their own way and had a fearful parents that always kept them, kept them back and therefore they didn't have that, they lost touch with that spontaneity, qual spontaneous quality of being to be able to just go and to show up and they're always holding back and as a result feel that they lost their strength and they might show up in their personality either as collapsed as one compensation from the ego or tough and neither one of them brings them to the same place that that strength and that free individuation would bring them and so by confronting that that quality in the ego they can start to under, uncover what happened see the defensiveness around it, the identification with it, and start to reclaim the beauty of their strength in its essential form. And so what are the essential qualities? The colors in the, the model that Well, we, there's, there's, there's so many, I couldn't begin to talk, but in the course that we lead, we work with one that has to do with the will, and we look at the false will of the ego, and we look at the, what true will feels like when you're very supported and grounded and present and not efforting to try to make something happen, but basically trust that you have what it takes inside yourself to meet the challenges of life. I mean, that's an amazing space. Most of us have real issues with that. You know, we get tense and we, we start to push and effort it. Second one is courage, which I just described. We call that the red, you know. And then the black has a lot to do with our shadow and the parts of us that have been withheld. And in that is the most, it's the, the quality of the black when it's really experienced is the part of our being that is very peaceful and powerful and loves the truth. And so truth is the motor for, or the fuel for giving, arising that aspect of essence. Green is the compassion and the compassion largely for yourself 
and, and really bringing that understanding in of how I became the way that I am. You know, so it's a big heart opener. And then joy naturally arises and there's a great quote from Almas that um, joy is the, oh, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> expression of the heart when truth is seen or something like it's, that? It's, it, joy is the something of, of the heart when truth is appreciated. The fragrance of the heart? You could say that. Something joy like that. is the radiation of the heart when truth is appreciated. And I think that's such a great thing to just get. You know, it makes us happy to be aligned with the truth which there's a celebration that starts to happen inside because we're not going with our defenses, our beliefs, our um, self-images and doubts. And it releases the heart because the heart's nature is joyous. Obviously, since the beginning of the pandemic, in-person groups aren't happening, happening at the same level. Like we've, um, something that I think we've been really pleased with is we found that you can have really quite profound experiences online. Um, if it's a well-held process, it's not the same. Obviously, like a, a deep sort of transformational seven-day process where you can really go through. And um, I've had some extraordinary experiences on, on, on different workshops like that. And it's not quite the same online, but you can actually have quite, or what we found is that you can pleasantly surprised by by the depth that can be achieved online. Mm. Have you? What have you found since the beginning of the pandemic? The same, you know, a bit of resistance to it at first because I'm attached to the other, and um, and now a kind of either surrender or resignation. I'm not sure <laughs> which. Sometimes. But but I've come to embrace the online format, and one of the things that I. And better to say, I've come to embrace the online format and I can see that people really do get a lot from it. And it's amazing what can happen through a screen that I thought was only limited to a working space for a group. Um, and the other great thing about it is that it gives the possibility to reach a lot of people that wouldn't otherwise be able to travel, take time off, pay the expenses of a group, etc. So it starts to open up to much broader audiences. And I think the things, I don't, I can't speak for all the things that are online, but I'm, I'm really happy with the things that I've created and with my partner, Taria, have created for audiences where I know for sure we're, we're talking to people all around the planet that wouldn't otherwise be there. And it's very satisfying. And the feedback that's come back is really good too. So we've just launched a new online platform called Dimensions of Being, where we plan to do a series of groups that we have formerly happened only in group rooms. And of course, it takes an adaptation to do them as an online course. Um, but I'm excited about it. I have to say my enthusiasm has uh, risen. So in one of the ways that we, to make people get a sense of who Taria and I are and a little bit about this process we're doing, which we're calling Initiation to Essence, is we, we did three, I think, 20-minute little clips called Invitation to Essence, which anybody can access. And they, they meet us and they get a little bit more sense of what the course is about and hopefully feel inspired to do the longer course. So Rafia, thank you. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I hope people really enjoy it. And I just want to say thank you for everything that you've done for me over the last 10 years or so. You've been incredibly supportive, um, especially since the, the death of my father, and that's been incredibly meaningful. So thank you. Mm, David, I feel a bit emotional as you say that myself. It touches me and my friendship with you is very important to me personally and the work that you're doing and what you're bringing to the world means a lot to me right now. So rebel wisdom is like kind of tattooed on my soul. So thank you very much.
So I hope you enjoyed the film. Rafia is genuinely one of the best facilitators I know. And if you're interested to work with him and learn the essence work we talked about, check out his new course in the show notes below. You can register and get the free intro films. And Rebel Wisdom is also doing an affiliate deal because we believe in this work. It means you can get a discount and you're helping Rebel Wisdom at the same time. So thank you.